Okay. We are back. Um, like I said, the example we're going to do here to finish this section is surface area a, a cone. So we could go back to the very beginning of the class, the very first day uh, when we were looking at, no, maybe not quite there, but near the beginning of the class, we had uh, these double cone things and we had the equation of them, all these uh, quadric surfaces things. So um, if you want to get a cone, well, we did the cone through the, like the double cone through the origin. I want to shift it up so that We'll, we'll do the most general formula here. So it's the cone, which is h high, and the bottom of the cone has radius a. So I'm not sure if this formula is in the book. I forgot to look. It might be. I think it might be. Yeah, it is. So it's in the appendix. So good, we're going to prove this one. Um, maybe I won't. Hmm. Should I give it away? Nah, we're not going to give it away. So the surface area of the cone. Now all we need to do is we need to know what this equation is for the surface and then we can integrate it over the shadow. So that's that's all, all we're doing in here. So the equation we could get from the previous section, I think it was literally 10.1, um, that z equals um, <clears throat> well, technically we were gonna we're gonna find the bottom cone, so it's gonna be a negative square root. Uh, it's gonna be the square root of x squared plus y squared, but it's gonna be the negative square root, and it's gonna be scaled in a way so that we actually get h high and a across, and this becomes h over a, and that's what it would be normally. But then I wanna I wanna move it up. Uh, and so any sort of shift, if you add a number, it shifts it in that direction. So we haven't done too much of that, maybe none of it. Uh, that right. So if you add something to the z equation, it moves it along the z axis, just like a regular shift. So that's the equation of the cone. We're not, we could add on the, we know what the surface area of the bottom of the cone is. Let's do the slanty part. Um, so we get that. The shadow region, you might as well just go ahead and draw it, is once again a circle with radius a. So that's the bottom, the bottom of the cone. Oh, shit. And R, as we've been calling it. So let's probably want to do this in polar, uh, but let's at least get the setup on this. So the surface area. The equation says it's the double integral of the square root of one plus the each partial derivative added together, each squared and added together of the a. So that's the formula. So we need to find the partial derivatives, square them, add them, add one, square root, and then integrate and find the correct way to parameterize the bounds. And I'm going to probably just go straight to polar because the rest is going to look pretty uh, pretty ugly. Okay, so we need so here's my function. I need to find the x partial derivative of this guy, and it's, it looks kind of similar to the to the sphere. So let's see, the h is going to disappear. I'll have minus x minus h over a. That's the constant, and then I take the derivative of this, which I could write as x squared plus y squared to the half if I wanted to. So I will get one half x squared plus y squared uh, to the negative a half, multiply by the derivative of the inside. So that'll be two x. So this is all starting to look fairly similar. So if I simplify that down, let's see the twos will cancel. I'll have minus h x on the top. I'll have a on the bottom, but I'll also have the square root of x squared plus y squared. The negative, negative power means put it on the bottom, the half means square root. So there's, there's your fx. And I think maybe just to save a little bit of space, similarly, uh, fy will be negative hy over a times the square root of 
That's the very first last one. They do the same derivative, except the chain rule part will be 2y instead of 2x. So surface area would be the double integral over the region of the square root of 1 plus, and then I square these things. So I will get h squared. Um, what am I going to get here? I'll get h squared, x squared, a squared, and then x squared plus y squared. And then the other one will be h squared, y squared, and over a squared and x squared plus y squared. So like all the square roots go away and everything else gets a square. Uh, yeah. And actually this is nicer, this is even nicer than um, for, for the sphere, I think, because you get the double integral over the region. And what's left when I put all this stuff together, I'll get one plus, and the top will be h squared x squared plus h squared y squared. So let's factor out an h squared on the top. I'll have h squared x squared y squared and the denominator will be a squared x squared plus y squared so when i put just those last two together and factor out h squared the x squared plus y squared just cancel out and i get h squared over a h a, h squared over a squared and then and then ba there's no more there's no more there's just no more i mean that's 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 basically it so if i wanted to I could just factor that out, and I can factor this out as 1 plus h squared over a squared times the double integral of 1 dA. So actually, I don't have to parameterize it at all. It's not hard, but thank goodness. Because what does that represent? What does this re uh, integral represent? It's the area of R. So that should be in your memory banks now. If you integrate the function 1, over r of dA, you just get the area of r. So it's a circle, so the area is just, uh, what is the area? Pi r squared, but, but, it, but the radius is a, so it's pi a squared. So there you go. There's the equation for the surface area. It's not the one you see in the back of the book because they, they do clean it up a little bit. Uh, let's see, you get a common denominator on the inside, that would be a squared. If you multiply this one by a squared over a squared, you'll get a squared plus h squared. That'll be under that square root. Then you take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. So that's the square root of a squared plus h squared over the square root of a squared, which is just a. And then one, the A in the bottom will cancel one of the A's on the top. So you end up getting this, pi times A times the square root of A squared plus H squared. And that right there is the surface area of the slanted part of the cup. And that formula is in the appendix in the book. Maybe you've seen it before, I'm not sure. So that's the slanted part of the cone surface area. If you wanted to know the whole surface area, then you just add the surface area on the bottom, which is an additional pi r squared, because it's just a circle. And then you'll get the full formula for if you want the entire surface area, not just the slanted part, but the bottom as well. You can add that. So those, those types of problems are just come out of, can you use this formula properly? It means can you find the derivatives properly? plug them in, do the algebra correctly, and, um, and then figuring out what the parameterization is, depending on whether it's like a nice thing with X and Y, or if it's a circle and you'd rather do polar. So, anyway. I think that that's, I could do more examples, but I think it's better if you just kind of work some of that stuff yourself, because it's really not much different than what we've been doing up to this point, except the int integrals. Um, all right, so let's see if you guys have homework questions on anything at this point.
Sir, can you go over problem 20 for 13.2? 20. Yes, sir. Okay, so what it says is, man, font is small. Okay, so it says we want to do the integral over the region, which is specified by this, of the function cosine y squared. Now, as, as it stands, you're supposed to do a y integral first. But the problem is, is you come over here and you're like, okay, what is the antiderivative of y, of cosine of y squared? And the answer is, I don't know. Um, and in fact, I don't know even if Wolfram Alpha knows. So if you want, you can go look at Wolfram Alpha, and the answer that it will give will be some god awful uh, made up function, which is probably called like the integral of cosine y squared function, which is kind of puns, because this does not have a nice form. This, this integral does not have a nice form, even if you could find it. Uh, but the nice thing is, is I don't really necessarily need to know it if I could rewrite this where x and y were reversed. And if I do an x integral first, this doesn't have any x's in it, so I can treat it as a constant. So what I would like to do is I would like to convert this into cosine x, y squared dx dy, so that when I do the interior integral, this is just a constant, and I'll get that constant times x. But, but the question is, is what are the new bounds? So what I have to do is I have to come over here and I have to find the shadow region R uh, by the fact that Y is between X and the square root of pi over two for the curves. And the numbers, X is between zero and square root of pi over two. So if I drew that, I would say, okay, so Y equals X is here. So I want to be bigger than <clears throat> bigger than that, which means I want to be above it. And if I drew the square root of pi over two, which is like why the square root of pi over two? Probably because I'm going to plug it in and I'm, and I'm going to square it out. So I draw that line. So I want to be in between those two things, except I only want to do that up to zero to pi over two. So I'm talking about that region right there is my R. It has to be above the y equals x and has to be below this other line. So that's the parameterization that way. If I convert it so that I look, um, instead of up and down, I look left and right, then I can get x between two curves and I can get y between two numbers. So numbers here, curves here. So the numbers for y are just, they, I mean, this is nice and symmetric, so at least the numbers are zero and square root of pi over two. The x's, if I look side to side, it will be going from y equals zero, the y-axis, so that's the y-axis today, x equals zero is the y-axis, up to uh, the line. And if it's y equals x, then it's also x equals y. So this will be converted into this set. So this stuff takes a while, it's a lot of practice, uh, convincing yourself that it works, but you really have to sort of either turn your head and think curves one direction or the other. But anyway, if you do that, then you can plug it into here when you get cosine y squared dx dy. But now the bounds are zero to y and zero to the square root of pi over two. And now you're like, is that any better? And the answer is yes, because this interior integral is now just that constant cosine of y squared times x. All right, does that still look any easier? I don't know. Let's plug in the bound and plug in y. And now typically the way we write this was we write the polynomials first and then the trig function so we don't accidentally recombine them. If I plug in y, I'm just going to multiply it in front instead. You can make lots of little mistakes. So we get this integral now to do. And now we can do this one because we have 
y squared and we have y. So u would be y squared, du would be 2y dy. And so if we, if we you know, plug, plug in uh, math 124 here, we will be able to get that this is equal to the sine of e of y squared all over 2. That'll be the integral. If you plug it in, you'll get cosine of u. There will be a half. You integrate cosine, you get sine, and then plug the y squared back in. So substitution going on there. Now when we plug in 0 and pi over 2, now we can see that when we plug in the square root of pi over 2, it gets squared. So that'll be pi over 2. It's a sine of that, which is 1. So we get 1 half, and we plug in the top bound. If you plug in the bottom bound, you get the sine of 0, which is 0. So you subtract out 0. Okay. It all comes from this practice of can you take the bounds, recreate the function, reverse all the situation, and then, and then plug it back in? Hope that makes sense. Thank you, sir. What else? Well, we tempted to just knock out 13.6 or at least get pretty far into it, set it up so that we can come back on Monday and just review, 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 take the test Tuesday and then continue review, review for the final. And I'll try and give you a sort of a practice final in there at some point. So that's what we're going to do. Sorry about it, but we're going to pack it all in here today. We can, re we can refresh it on, on Monday. But I think while we're brain is still kind of active, um, let's let's see what this thing looks like. And it, it's just a continuation of the stuff that we have been doing up to this point. So if we look again back at, you know, those like yours. So this is like um, old, maybe even really old. This is like back in 124. We would say, well, let's find the area between. Uh, curves. And the answer was back in the simple old days where we just had a one curve uh, where this was like uh, the function f2 and then we had a function f1 and we just took a and b and we wanted to find the area between them and the answer was just we take the integral from a to b of the top curve minus the bottom curve, and we'll get f2 of x minus f1 of x dx. And then we just integrate that out and da da da, and we get our number. And that's a positive number because it's the area between curves. We don't have to worry about signed area anymore for one thing. It really is like what is the true area between those two curves? Uh, and then we went, well, guess what? We can actually set this up to like slightly less old, meaning earlier in this, in this class, but not that long ago. We said, guess what? You could actually think of this as y is between, not zero, sorry, y is between f1 and f2 as curves. And x is between a and b as numbers. So it's just a slight reimagining of that region r. And we said that the area is just the double integral over the region of 1 dA. This nice little condensed formula uh, here, which, you know, if you rewrite it, looks like the integral from a to b of the integral from f1 of x to f2 of x of 1 dy dx. And one of the Fubini formulas says I can do dy dx. And guess what? If you do one integration, boom, you get right back to the formula that you had before. 
So just taking this inside part, rewriting it like backwards into an integral, a very simple integral, we can, we can condense this down into one double integral. So how do we then extend this out one more? We go from numbers to curves. So that's like from 1D to 2D, and now we want to go up to 3D. And so now we want to talk about the volume between surfaces. So just like we did area between curves, now we're in 3D. I'm just going to draw the picture on this one and then we'll put down what the formula is on the next page is X, Y, Z. The picture is just going to, it's just going to look, it's just going to look hard because we have to draw two surfaces. What are these? Like planes, uh, paraboloids, spheres, cones. So you're going to have to really use your imagination here. And I'm going to draw just as kind of a nice plane to start with and then maybe like some sort of curved thing down below. So this will be my top surface. And this is given by an equation. Uh, and I'm going to just use it like this, z2 of x and y. And my bottom surface, oh, I don't want to write that there. I want to leave a little bit of room here. The bottom surface will be z1 of x, y, z. And so do I want the entire volume in between these? Well, no, because up in the old one, what did I do? Did I want the entire area between the curves? No, I want it only between two, two x values. So now what do I do over here? Well, I say I don't want it necessarily all the thing. I need to restrict it. And so I restrict it to a shadow region. So I take my shadow region down here. That's R. I extend that up to hit these two, these two surfaces. And here's one, and here's the other. So I just take R and reverse the shadow back up. And I'm talking about the volume of that sort of cylindrical, squished cylindrical thing in between. So I want the volume of this 3D object here Of, and in this case, instead of calling this region down here R, they call this like a solid domain. I don't know why we keep reusing words in that, but it's the volume of, I'm just going to write D. So this shape up here, this 3D shape is going to be called D. The shadow of it is R. The top of it is the top surface, and the bottom of it is the bottom surface. But how do you figure out the volume of of that thing. Well, it's going to look really similar. It's going to be a double integral over the region of the top surface minus the bottom surface. So just like before, we take the top minus the bottom, and then we integrate over our part. Wish I had enough room on here, but maybe it's best to like get rid of some of this clutter and just go to the next one, is that the volume of that shape, D, is going to be the double integral over the region of the top surface minus the bottom surface. Just like you did in Calc 2, except now they're not curved, they're surfaces. So that means they're functions of x and y minus this other function, z1. z2 minus z1, dA. Um, but just as we do, it's like, this never ends. So if we were able to parameterize R in such a way that this went from number X1 to number X2, or, and then the next one would be curves. So that's a curve, which I'm going to write as Y1 and Y2. Then I can convert this whole inside into a third integral, which is now surfaces. Z1 of X and Y, Z2 of X and Y, and this will be 1 DZ DY DX.
Don't worry, this is about as bad as it gets. Um, and so, guess what? The notation for this, here's the notation, is the volume of D, let's write D, so I don't want to write too much letters here. The volume will be the triple integral over the domain that you've created, which is like that whole 3D object of one dv. Ta -da. Look at that. Nice, simple. It's so innocent just sitting there. It's like one. How hard could this possibly be? Um, before, we, before we do an example, uh, let me just let me just say this. Remember, okay, so here's the old one, dA. How many different ways could we write that? We could write that as dx dy, or you could write it as dy dx, or you could write it as r dr d theta. Those are the three different ways that you can figure out how to take the shadow region and rewrite it. Okay, the new one, I'll show you the cringing at this point, we could write this as dz dy dx, if you thought about it as top surface and bottom surface, and then you parameterize it with curves and numbers for y and x. Or you could do, like come back over here, if I could do dx dy, why don't I do dy dx and vice versa? So I have dy dx, I could write this as dz dx dy, where now it's surfaces curves for x and then curve numbers for y. So it's surfaces, curves, and numbers as you go out. But those are just two. We could also, we could reverse any of these things. So we could write this as dx dy dz. I'm running out of arrows here. We could, we could write this as dy dx dz. We could write this as, I'm putting on this one here. I can write this as dx dz dy, or I could write this as dy dz dx. So I have six, six different things I could do. And that's what I'm gonna make you do only on the final. This is not on the next task. It's gonna be on the final. It's gonna be set this up. I'm not gonna have you work this out because it's too much of a time. Set your answer up in six different ways. So something to look forward to here. Um, we have that. We also have, if this keeps getting better, um, I think I'm gonna put it on the next page. But there's six different ways to figure this out. The volume will be if I put a one in here. Now, what else have I put in there? Uh, the other thing I have put in my integral before is density. So here's the deal, is, is if, if I have a density function, but now density is, in, is a function of x, y, and z, here's the density function for d then I bet I'm going to be able to get masses and essentially with masses and things like that, which is now kind of really, I mean, it's like the important part. If you start from the beginning, we should say, what's the center of mass of this sphere? What's the center of mass of this cone? What's the center of mass of this cylinder or this parabolic paraboloid type shape or something? You know, uh, go in space, kind of want to know how these things rotate. Um, one, of my, one of my friends, this really does get into the stuff. He worked for the Air Force looking at stability of planes based on the fuel that was being like pumped through the through all of the parts. Um, and so you gotta worry about the center of mass of all of this stuff and, or, or, or leads to instability. So this is the basic stuff with like a very basic shape. Now what happens about center masses of flowing fluids, flowing gasoline or, or through through pipes in a plane or through tubes in a plane. It's it's, it's super complicated stuff. But we're not going to collect it that far. But if we do the, the triple integral over the domain of the density function dv, what did we get before if we did the double integral over the region of the density? Well, you get the mass. So this would be in the, in the mass of your, of your object. Uh, now we have three uh, new things where we either put in x. And this is going to be like a moment for the for x. The next one is going to be a moment. And I'll write what the left side is here in a second. 
uh, multiply y times the density, and I multiply z times the density and integrate all of those three things. These are going to be the first moments that in order to get the center of mass or the centroid, if it's a constant density, then I'm going to want to do x bar, y bar, z bar as whatever those things are, and I'll give you the notation here in a second, of divisions of the first one divided by m, the second one divided by m, and the third one divided by m. But just like we had before, where it was my over m and mx over m, um, this is the new notation for it. It's if you do x, and this is hard to see in 3D, if you have x and you're pushing on x, it doesn't just cause you to rotate around y, it causes the entire yz plane to turn. So you might think about it like you have something pointing out along the x-axis. You start pushing, it's going to cause the whole yz plane to turn. So now you don't just have one axis and one axis, you have, one, you have a plane in the axis. And so you're, you're actually affecting the, the turn uh, of the moment of the yz plane. I think that kind of makes sense. You've got this thing, when you push along the uh, axis, it'll cause the yz plane to turn. So this is called the first moment for the yz plane or about the yz plane. Uh, this one, what's it going to happen if you push in the y direction? So what's going what's to rotate is going to be the xz plane. So this is n xz. And they will often lead the word plane off. Uh, and then this one will cause the yz plane to rotate. So those will be the first moments for each of those planes. And so this is m, I'm going to drop the word plane, myz, mxz, and mxy. Just but think, either think planes or think, look, I need it two letters down here. If it's x, I don't have an x. If it's y, I don't have a y. If it's z, I don't so y, z, x, z, and x, y. So these 3D, these triple integrals will either give you volume, mass, or these moments. And we could even go further, but we're going to stop there. And when I said there were six ways to write dv, there's at least, I don't know, there's many more. If you wanted to, you know, this is 13.7. You could, again, look at cylindrical coordinates or you can look at spherical coordinates and you end up getting the text here. Uh, you end up, for cylindrical coordinates, you end up, it looks like polar. It's R, D, Z, D, R, D, theta. So it's like R, D, R, D, theta, and you pick up this extra D, Z. So that's what DV would look like there. Uh, cylindrical is terrible. Um, you end up getting uh, rho squared times the sine of phi times d rho d phi d theta. So we're not going to do it, but uh, you end up picking, picking up a lot more in, in your own book. That's just how it is. So these, these get real interesting pretty quick when you're doing them. Get pretty complicated. So let's try, let's try the, our very basic example here where we have our plane which is coming in and hitting at one, one, one. And we just have a plane that comes in. We've done this one before. It hits the plane or hits the uh, coordinate axes at one, one, and one. Therefore, it creates these lines. And I want to talk about the, uh, the well, I'll just write it like this. The domain is going to be under that plane which is x plus y plus z equals one, and it is uh, in the first option. So how would you do the setup um, on that? So what we're going to do is we're going to do these six, these six setups. I think that'll be probably enough for, for this morning. We'll, we'll finish up an example on Monday and then just do a ton of review. So this does take a little like 3D spatial awareness here that um, I don't know. it just takes cut once again it comes from practice. So dv 
we have six choices for DD. Um, and they all come from like a scrambling of DZ, DY, and, and DX. And within combinatorics, if you have three things and you can reorder them however you want, there's three factorial ways to do it, which is six. So you have all the possible orderings of DZ, DY, and DX. And there are six of them. I don't want to go true quadrupling, although you have like 24 different things, and I'm not sure what that is. Yeah, what would that mean? You'd have like hyper volumes and crazy stuff. Okay, so let's try DZ, DY, DX. So what does that mean? That means that Z is going to have to be between two surfaces. So you're going to think from what's the lowest surface for Z and what's the highest surface for Z. And then once you get the surfaces, then you're going to have to look at the shadow region and figure out what curves Y is between. And then you're going to have to figure out what numbers X is between. So like the shadow region is, is this part down here. So that's the stuff we've been doing all along. The only thing that changes is, is the top one. So let's look at that object there. What are the surfaces that are creating that? Well, the bottom of the object is just the XY plane. So that's that's the bottom of your of your triangular prism. Again, this is X, Y, and Z. The bottom of your object is the XY plane. So if you can see that, that's the surface, just Z equals zero. I know it looks like a number, but again, in 3D, that's a plane. What is the top of the object? Well, the top is that slanted plane. So that's the plane that you're given. So the, surf, the top is this triangular shape here, which comes off of the plane. So that will be solve for z there. z equals 1 minus x minus y. And that's the, so that's the equation of the plane. So that means that Z is going to be between those two things. So over here, if we wanted to fill it in, Z is above zero, so it's bigger than zero, and it's less than one minus X minus Y. And those are surfaces. Okay, so now let's look at the shadow region. So take this whole thing, come down to the shadow region down below. And so my R will look like X, Y, it's at one, it's at one, and there's my shadow region. There's R. So now let's do the curves. What is the top of this as far as curves are concerned, and what is the bottom? Well, the bottom of R is just the x axis, and that's y equals zero as a line. Now, so z equals zero appears as a plane, y equals zero appears as a line. We need a better notation for that, but that's what we got. Uh, that's the x-axis. What's the top of the region? Well, the top of the region is, is a line. So what is the equation of that line? It's y equals mx plus b. What's the slope of that line? Well, you go down one and you go over one, so it's negative one is the slope. So negative x, what's the y-intercept? It's one. So the top will be y equals negative x plus one. And so I could put that in here. It's above the x-axis, so y is bigger than zero, and it's less than negative x plus one. And then the numbers for x, now x, the numbers are zero to one. So hopefully that part's easy to see. <clears throat> so what happens if we try and put all this together into a formula, dz, dy, dx, in order to do the setup, um, okay, the next one here. So that means the setup for this, leave this off for a second, because I don't really, I don't know what I'm going to put in there. If I put in a one, I'll get volume. If I put in a delta, I get mass and so forth. But the setup, at least, uh, for integrating any of those will then be 
X is going from zero to one as numbers, so that's that dx. Uh, y is going from zero to one minus x as curves. And as surfaces, z is going from zero to one minus x minus y. So dx, dy, dz. And whatever you put in there, again, I don't know, put in one or delta or x delta or y delta or z delta. At least that's the setup for calculating it in this order. One down, five to go. Um, at least the easy thing for the second one is let's try and keep z on the end where it is so we still have the surfaces we're talking about and just switch y and x. So what about that side? So it's the same surfaces. So that means the inside, and I wrote this wrong. Sorry. I should have worked inside in. So Z is first, that goes with yeah. Y is next, so that goes with that. And then X is left. Sorry. Z goes with these, Y goes with those, X goes with that. I got a little carry. So let me get it right this time. Z is gonna go first, uh, and then I even wrote this one back this time. I want Z to go first, so that's got to go. So Z is going to go first, then DX, and then DY. Okay. Yeah. So it's still surfaces, curves, and numbers, except surfaces for Z, which still are the same. That's still going to be the same. That part's the same. What does change is the, the, the bounds on these two, because now for my shadow region, or I'm going to be thinking this way. So I want curves for x and numbers for y. So x is between two things. Y is between two numbers. So curves and numbers. Uh, the numbers are usually the easy one. I mean, y is going from zero to one. So boom, zero to one. What is x going between? Well, x is going from the y-axis to the line. So the y-axis is x equals zero again, as a line. And this equation of this line, so the line was y equals negative x plus one, but I now need to convert that into x equals in order to get the curve by the side. Now it's an easy one at least that you know if I solve for x here, it's just going to be minus y plus one. Bring the y over, bring the y over, so I'll get minus y plus one. So that means when I put all this stuff in here, y will go from zero to one, and now x will go from zero to minus y plus one. So I get my z, and I get my x, and I get my y. And notice, any of these six things that I do when I work them out, you'll get the same answer because they all represent the same thing. Either they all represent volume, or they all represent time, so they all represent a moment. So we've done Z and then Y and then X. This is Z and then X and then Y. So surfaces for Z, curves, then numbers, and then numbers. So that's two, two down. They kind of come in pairs, as you might have noticed. So let's see. Well, we didn't maybe notice that. Draw the curve, draw the thing again. I'm still talking about just this domain. So there's B, that's Y, Z. And now something we kind of haven't done yet, but let's think about this as surfaces or X. So now, very from the very beginning, think about it as which equations for X as surfaces is this thing in between? So now we're thinking kind of like back to front. So as opposed to for the Z, you look bottom to top. Now we're reversing it, so you're looking back to front. So what is the so for X, the back of the object is just the Y Z plane. And the equation of that Y Z plane 
in 3D is just x equals zero. And again, we're reusing this over and over, but in 3D, x equals zero means the plane. What is the front of the object coming in? Well, the front of the object is the slanted plane. And that, that's the only other equation that we have. So, but this time we're going to solve for it in terms of x. So it was x plus y plus z equals 1. So this will be x equals 1 minus y minus z. So those will be my bounds for my surface, for my surfaces. So that'll be the inside input. This will be the inside input. Now when I do the shadow region, I have to take x out and look at the shadow region for y and z. So that's what's going to be the back of the object here. So the shadow region now will be y and z. Um, so I have to parameterize that using y's and z's. The nice thing is it looks very similar. Um, instead of x and y, I've got y and z. The equation of this line is still going to be, in this case now, z equals negative y plus 1, or it'll be z, y equals negative z plus 1. So this is, this, that's the line. And so when I do my triple integral, I'm actually going to do both of them at once here. So if I do dx first, then I do z, and then I do y, or I do x first, and then I do y, and then I do z. It's still going to be surfaces, curves, and numbers. And again, the inner two ones, you're looking at the shadow region are. So the surfaces are going from 0 to 1 minus y minus z. So that's these parts here. And that's the same if you do it down here. Because x is first, so you do surfaces. Now do curve. What is z in between for curves? Well, it's starting down at the bottom and it's going up until it hits the line. So it's starting at the line zero and it's going up to the line minus y plus one. Y is now numbers and that's zero to one. Um, for the final parameterization, instead of thinking uh, down, we think left and right. So what is y going between? It's going between the z-axis, which is 0, out to the line. And the, the equation of the line in that case is minus z plus 1. And very similarly, z is going between 0 and 1. So for this shape, you're going to have lots of these symmetries where it looks like all the, the variables are shifted around. If we do something more complicated, it won't look quite as simple here. Because the shadows are all going to look different depending on which way you do the shadow. So let's, uh, let's try this one more time. If we're going to let y go first, x, y, z, y, z. If you think about it as surfaces, y. Now in this picture it's like we're going from the back, in this case it's kind of like the left surface, is now the xz plane for y equals zero as a plane. But the right surface here is the slanted plane. And that will be y equals 1 minus x minus z. So you can see this, they all look kind of similar here. So it goes from the left to the right surfaces. And then we're going to do the shadow, which means we're going to shadow it down the y direction. And we're going to get the shaded part that I've drawn here. And now that's in the x to z plane. So the shadow region r now looks like that. But based on all this, the symmetry stuff, this line here, I'm either going to write as z equals negative x plus 1 or x equals negative z plus 1. 
The lower parts are all zero, whether you think of them as numbers or as curves. So when I do my two integrals here, I'll either get the triple integral dy and then dz and then dx, or I'll get the triple integral of y and then x and then z. In either case, the interior surfaces are zero and one minus x minus y minus z, zero and one minus x minus z. And then when I look at my shadow region, um, I'll get curves and numbers. And for z, it's zero and negative x plus one. And x is zero and one. Or I look at it as far as x curves left to right, zero and negative t plus one. And the numbers z is going zero to one. So those are the final two. So we have all six of these things set up um, and they all represent the same thing. So why would you do all six? Well, it's math class, so I'm gonna make you do all six, but um, at the same time, sometimes the integrals will be easier than others. Working these things out is annoying. If this thing inside is difficult at all, when you integrate it, start plugging this in, it might be squaring or cubing things out, and you have to do another integral on top of that, and then you have to do another another integral on top of that. So it really is just like truly triple triple the integration. And it kind of gets gets easier as you do the integrals, but the inside ones you have lots of chances to miss like minus signs and squares and cubes. And when you if you were to square this kind of thing out, now you've got like to foil three things out. So it can get long, long super quick. So anyway, we will do we will do more of these things. Maybe I'll just draw one little picture to say, suppose the uh, image was not the one I drew, but just, and I'm not gonna do any of the integrals, we're just looking at what the shadows might look like. So suppose you have a pyramid that's been, that came down like this. So the front of, yeah. So you have this pyramid shape in the first quadrant. And so here's X, Y. And Z. So what happens to the three shadows is if you look in the XY plane, so the shadow down on this pyramid, maybe that's not too hard to see that the shadow is going to be um, this shape here, which comes from the bottom of the object. So it looks a little bit longer for Y than it does for X. So when you do the shadow, the region is going to be there. So when you figure out your curves and your numbers, that one's not too bad because it's a rectangle. But I could do this shadow where the shadow comes down and hits XZ. So now we're thinking Y direction, but what happens if we shine a light down there? Well, that shadow is going to be this triangular shape when you shine everything down. It's like a matter of perspective. You're standing here at Y and you look down, lose all depth, the shadow is going to look like that instead. So it's the back of this sort of thing. Or you might have the shadow if you wanted to do surfaces where you have the shadow down in the YZ plane. And now I'm looking from X projecting back. I'm going to be getting this back triangle here. So maybe that's the easiest one to see from the picture is you'll get a shadow that looks like that. You're either going to get the bottom of the object, you're going to get the side of the object, or you're going to get the back of the object, depending on which shadow region you're, you're, you're talking about. And those will be all the interior integrals when you find R. The surfaces will be, you know, these, you'll have to figure that out. These are going to be this like planes. It looks like the Y's, the axis systems are set up so that you're going to be going from like zero to something. Um, so as complicated as you can draw this, you know, the shadows will, will come out. We'll do, we'll do a couple more of those. I think, let me just see if there are, as I've done that, if it jogs your memory on any other homework questions before we let our brain breathe a little bit. So any, any final homework questions? Sir, can you go over problem 14 for 13.3 real quick? 13.3, 14? Yes, sir. All right.
Well, that was not very nice. I think it's the kind of thing that when you draw it, all of the parts will come together. So I'm gonna leave the, this part out. Uh, they're all, since all of the integrals are uh, x plus five, uh, I should be able to recombine you know, all, so all these, it's, I guess it's small, so just write it down. So this is, and then we go negative one to one of square root of one minus x squared to four minus x squared. We're integrating x plus five dy dx. And then the last one will be one to two of zero. Right, okay, so I know what's gonna happen here. Um, you have three different integral setups. It's kind of like region one, region two, and region three. So I think we can draw a fairly good picture here. So on region one, what is happening? Well, you've got this curve, y equals four minus x squared, which if you squared it out and add it to the other side, the x squared, you'd have x squared plus y squared equals four. So this is a circle of radius two, uh, but only the top half because it's, you have a positive square root. So. You get that that one there. Um, just just for because we know we're going to need these things. Uh, y equals one minus x squared. That'll end up being x squared plus y squared equals one. But, it's, but again, it's still the top half because it's the, the positive square root. So we're going to need this this as well. And now let's try to interpret what all of these things mean. This means right here, only from negative two to one, so negative two to one, I want to know the answer for y between zero and the curve, uh, which is the upper half circle for the radius two one. So this first one is that area right there. So that's R1. R2 says that I want to go from minus one to one. I want to be above the circle of radius one and below the circle of radius two. And I need to be above this circle. And I need to be below this circle. And I need to do that from negative one to one. So I'm talking about that region right there. That's R2. And then the last one, maybe not too surprising if we set this up right, from one to two, I want to be above the x-axis and below the circle of radius two, so I would get R3. So we've got R1, R2, and R3. And since we're integrating the same thing, we know that if we call this whole thing R, put R1, R2, and R3 together, then we know that all of this stuff here put together represents the integral over the entire region of x plus 5 dx. Is it the integral over this region, then the integral of this region, the integral of this region? If you have the same integral, you can combine the regions into one. And this is what all these three things represent is this. Now, if you wanted to rewrite this using dx dy, then you'd have to chop up your integral. I'm not going to do it, but Let's see, we have to take this and this, and then if I thought left to right, you know, I have a part here, and then I have a part there, and then I have a part there, because they all have like different left and right parameters. You know? so on this top part, we've got a left and we've got a right. But down here, we've got a left, but this is the right part, the right curve. And then we have a new left curve and a new right curve. So if you did this dx dy, then you'd have to break this up into three new, three new ones. But it's claiming that you can do this in polar, and it's of course true if you do your circle. Um, but I can instead write this as r dr theta. Like that. I can write this 
because our cosine theta plus five. And then I just have to figure out how do I parameterize this in full? So the way it always works is you start at the origin, you go out until you hit the first curve, and that'll be my, my first function. And then I'll keep going until I hit the outer part, and that'll be my outer function. The nice thing is for circles, the equation of the circle is just r equals one, and this is the equation r equals two. So it's the simplest, the simplest function. I mean, it's like r equals one. Where's theta? There's no theta. Well, that means r all the way around. So just one and two would be my bounds for r. Again, still as curves, not just numbers. It's the entire circle. How do you specify the part? That comes from the angle. So what angle am I passing through here? Well, the angle starts over here at zero and it wraps around until it hits pi. So for numbers go, that means that's it. That's the real Much easier. Much easier to do. Well, yeah, I'll just say that <laughs> it's probably much easier to do. You know, multiply by the r, integrate the r, plug in one and two, then integrate the theta, plug in those, and uh, you'll get you get some number. Here. I think it's going to end up being it'll end up being positive for sure because x plus five on this region is always above. So you're talking about a surface above. What is this thing? I think you, can, you almost should be able to draw this. X, Y. It looks kind of like you could draw this in 3D. X, Y, Z. So we've got, this is the shadow region down below. This region on that. What is what is z equals x plus five look like? Well, if x is up here for a pi, if x is over here, you're down low. It kind of looks like a plane coming this direction. If I were to extend this up to the plane and wrap it around, it looks kind of like what you did is you took a cylinder, you cut a hole out of it, and then you sliced the top off of it. And you're doing sort of a diagonal thing. It's like a diagonal, it's, the picture's too small now, but it's kind of like a diagonal, if I turn it sideways, it kind of looks like this, and then you chop the hole out of the middle of it. And that represents the volume of that really poorly made uh, can or poorly made washer or precisely made can for a specific uh, need. <laughs> we can make up whatever we want at this stage. But you didn't have to know this part, but again, you should think now that these things do represent volumes under surfaces. And so the fact that it turns out to be a positive number makes sense because the plane does not drop down below. Otherwise, we'd have signed volumes and these things could be negative. So, there you go. Any other questions? I know that was a lot for today, um, but it really does come down to finding the shadow regions and parameterizing them nicely. If you can't do that uh, well yet, just do some more practice. Think. Geometrically, we can do more on Monday. We'll do a lot more on Monday. Um, I think we'll review, we'll do the test on Monday morning, or my, sorry, Tuesday morning, so that we can spend the afternoon finishing up review for the final, which is then on Wednesday morning. So, anyway, go work on that stuff and um, have a great weekend. Go try and find the comet if you can. Take pictures so you can show me. If you make that extra credit, go take pictures of the comet. Not, not online. You can't just go find something online. You have to do it from your hometown. And especially the Colorado guys, the air is clearer. If you're up high, you should be able to get something good if it's not cloudy. So 
extra challenge for you guys. So have a good weekend, and um, I will see you on Monday. Thank you, sir. Weekend, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. See you.